Resilient. Um, look at the definition of resilience. The ability to deal with continuous pressure and keep performing at a high level over extended periods of time and in conditions of ambiguity and uncertainty. Okay? Now, all of that can lead to conflict situation. Okay? When continuous pressure, easy to have a conflict when you're under pressure, easy to snap, yeah, easy to have an argument when people are under pressure, um, and you've got to keep performing at the same time, extended periods, and uncertainty as well. When somebody's um, uh, bottom two Maslow needs, and I've covered Maslow, uh, motive, um, uh, hierarchy of needs, Maslow called them your security and physiological needs, that when they are wobbly, it can also lead to conflict. In this case, it was about resilience. If, you, if you're very resilient, then it means you're a bit calmer, you're a bit more patient, you listen a bit more. Um, if you've got no resilience and you're majorly under stress, the tiniest little thing can come along and cause you conflict. So, can I just ask you guys, I'm so sorry to keep banging on about this, can everybody else hear that static? Or have I just got my microphone? Can you, can you hear me okay? Just drop me a note. No static. Okay, thanks Martin. So it's just coming through my end for some reason. Okay, great. Thank you guys. I'm, I'm sorry to keep stopping, but um, it was just coming through really loud anyway. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Right. So, resilience. Have reserves beyond. That's what we covered with resilience last time. Have reserves, self-care, be armed, have some tools and techniques, okay? So, resilience factors. So, in order to be resilient, and again, this is a recap, so if you think I'm going through it at speed, it's because I've already done a session on this, and it is on your YouTube channel, but it links directly into conflict management, resilience does, so we need to link those two things together, okay? So, in order to be resilient first, forget about conflict for a minute, this is about you being as resilient every single day as you can be, because the more resilient you are, the less conflicts come up because you're more prepared to deal with them if they arise and they don't impact you in the same way. And it could be the same thing that impacts you in two different ways depending on your level of resilience for the day. Okay? So you could go into work, feel good, feel resilient, feel like you're on top of everything, something goes wrong, oh dear, let's get, let's get it dealt with. Or you can go into work feeling low, feeling battered, not feeling resilient, something goes wrong and it's the end of the world when it comes to it. And there's a conflict that then starts to take place at that point, right? So, um, that's why this is so important in conflict resolution. A lot of companies, if you go on conflict uh, courses, they'll give you some tools to manage conflict. Well, I'm going to do that for you. Uh, oh, somebody's muted my microphone again. Can you hear me? So, who, who has muted me? I know there's no sound. Some. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, good. D I don't know what's going on, but somebody, whether they're doing it by accident or on purpose, somebody is muting me. It happened earlier on. It's just happened again then. I don't know why, um, but uh, it, it, somebody is muting me. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, hopefully you can hear me now. If it goes off again, please tell me. Gremlin, there are gremlins today. Yeah? Talk about conflict, yeah? Who, what, who's muting me? <laughs> That's a bit of conflict resolution for you, isn't it? Yeah? Uh, yeah, somebody's just left the meeting. Somebody keeps coming in and out. And I don't know what's happening, but they seem to be... It happened before. Somebody seems to be muting me. Never mind. Uh, it, after it happened, I could hear somebody typing on a keyboard. Yeah? Yeah, somebody... Joanna, was that you? Or are you just going, somebody's done it? <laughs> anyway, I'm back. 
All right, so I was ready to have a conflict then. Did you see that? I was ready for the conflict, right? Um, resilience. If you are more resilient, you are less likely to have a conflict. It's as simple as that. So when it comes to resilience, for those people that watched it, this is a recap. For those that didn't, take notes, okay? First thing you need to do is look after yourself. Self-care, okay? Hulk, smash it. Yeah, telling you, keeps putting me on mute. I know, Luke, my girlfriend would like to put me on mute a number of times, believe me, yeah? Oops, I think the last one was me. Sorry, not the early one. Well, do you know what, John? I, um, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you very much. Conflict averted. <laughs> You're all right, no worries. So, resilience factor, uh, self-care, looking after yourself, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, being solution focused, not problem focused. That's also uh, having a resilient mindset. Um, having a meaning and purpose. That might sound a bit deep, might it on a Tuesday morning. Uh, but why do you do what you do? If you've got a meaning and purpose for you do, go, doing what you do, then you are just more resilient. Yeah, so if you've got a, if, if work gives you a meaning and a purpose, you feel satisfied, you, you know, you get on with your colleagues, you have a bit of banter, it builds your self-esteem, you contribute to society, all that type of stuff, then it makes you more resilient because there's a meaning behind it, okay, on the back of it. Um, social environment, um, having uh, people around you, which has obviously been hit quite a lot. Uh, in uh, COVID uh, times and lockdown and everything else, um, this actually drops our resilience. When we don't get our social fix, yeah, that was a needle, by the way, I don't know if you realise that, uh, but when we don't get our social fix, um, our resilience drops. Yeah, not a lot of people don't make that equation, uh, but it happens. Now, of course, it depends on your personality profile and whether you're a really high yellow uh, or a really uh, low yellow or, or, or green. Uh, I'm just having a look to see if we've got um, uh, high yellow uh, Nicola on. No, we haven't. She was on this morning. Uh, if you are a high yellow, you need more you need more social interaction than a, a, a low yellow, for argument's sake. However, you still need some. You could have the most introverted person in the world, they still need some form of social environment uh, to be in. Social, um, a, a social environment, social needs is the third need in Maslow's hierarchy. So, you know, solitary confinement is a punishment in our, industry, in, in our culture, uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it, it drops resilience, okay. So, uh, we need that in play as well, and then, of course, a, a, a positive outlook or a positive intent. You're doing things for the right reason, and you, you you look, you know, cup cup half full along with solution focused. That's not to be that you you know. It's not to say you've got to be happy clappy. You can be realistic uh, with it, um, but that's what it comes. So I just want you to remember those factors. Now, when we did the resilience session, we went into them in detail. Um, which I'm not going to do right now because obviously I've got some more tools around conflict management for you. But if you if you want to look at them, go back to the YouTube video, find the resilience um, um, playlist, okay, uh, and, and take a look at that because those things, if you do, if you work on those things, it helps build your resilience at that point, okay? Um, there was something called the seven C's of resilience that we covered as well, uh, okay, so we're going to look at that briefly, right? Um, so if you want to be resilient, these are the seven things to think about. The first one, competent. So in order to be resilient and avoid conflict, because I'm going to start linking all this to conflict for you now, in order to be, to be more resilient and avoid conflict, then you need to be competent in what you're doing. Okay? <clears throat> this meeting chat is muted. Somebody's now muted the chat on here. I'm not quite sure what's, what's, what's happening here at all today, but hopefully you can still hear me because my microphone's still looking like it's on. Um, if you want to be, if you want to avoid conflict and be resilient, then you, the first C is about being competent. You need to be competent in what you're doing and the understanding of it to avoid any conflict. And also, it will help you with resilience. It's very, very simple, this. If you're not more competent, then you're more confident, which comes next. Yeah? So if you know the job and you, you know what you're doing and you regularly develop yourself and you look for new ways of doing things and you know, there's a constant education going on, then you are competent and that avoids more conflict at that point. Um, but it also makes you more confident. 
okay? And in order to be more confident, you want to learn more. It's a very, very simple equation, this. If there is something you're not very confident about, learn more about it. Learn it, apply it, practice it, adjust, learn, apply, practice, adjust, and so on and so on and so on, okay? Because it will make you more confident at that point, which again will give you more competence. So you know what you're doing, and again, you're avoiding lots of conflict at this point. Because if anybody was to question you, or do so, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Yeah, I wouldn't have done it that way. Then if you're confident and competent, you have a reason behind it, and you are much better placed to deal with the conflict. If this is a work-based conflict, of course, yeah? The next one is connection, so people. Now, this is quite a good one when it comes to conflict resolution, right? Um, again, in other sessions, I have put up the uh, relationship triangle. I think I've got it for you later in the course uh, today in the hour because conflict normally arises, worst case, normally arises between two people that don't trust each other. Okay, so that's normally what happens. Two people that don't trust each other, you yeah, might not even like each other, okay? And there's a conflict that arises. It might be a conflict of opinion. It might be a conflict of fact. It might be a conflict of personality. Uh, it might be a, a, a conflict of um, culture, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but it normally arises between two people that don't trust each other. So, it goes without saying, in order to deal with conflict before it even happens. The better relationships you have with people, the better you can deal with it. Because think of somebody that you implicitly trust. Just think of somebody in your head now. You implicitly trust them. It could be somebody at work, it could be your, your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, whatever, right? Think of somebody you implicitly trust, okay? If they do something that annoys you, that causes a conflict, right? You might get annoyed. You might even have a little argument, and we'll come on to that in a bit, yeah? But at no point will you think of ending the relationship over that thing, okay? Unless it's breaking the trust, and that's a separate conflict, okay? So, you know, uh, you know, if it's a big thing like they've broke your trust, had an affair, whatever, blah, 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 that's, that's different, they've broke the trust, yeah? Um, network quality is poor, you sound drunk. Uh, that's from Martin. Do I sound drunk to anybody else? Or is it just Martin? It's fine for you, Christian. Might be your end then, Martin, if people, uh, if other people think I'm okay. Just uh, keep going and keep me up to date if it gets any worse. Um, uh, in and out, yeah. Do you, know, it, you know, sometimes we get this. Uh, I've, got, I've got full connectivity, it's saying here. It's not saying, uh, yeah, there's normally a bit of a lag uh, uh, Philip, uh, depending on your broadband that you've got at home and where you are and all that type of stuff. Sorry guys, uh, if, if it's not as good as, uh, as normal, I'm not quite sure. I think whoever said gremlins in the system, definitely today, for some reason, some gremlins in the system. Uh, anyway, um, trust, uh, great relationships, yeah? If you've got a great relationship with people, then the conflict is a lot smaller. So if you've got a level of trust, with somebody, the conflict is a lot, lot smaller. It's not the world's ended. It's not that you're gonna break, break up your work uh, relationship or your friend relationship. It's something that you've just annoyed each other with. You deal with it and you move on, okay? So building relationships is key. I want you to bear that in mind because I'm gonna come on to it in a short while for you, okay? But of course, it also means if you've got great relationships with people, you're also more resilient because there's a, there's a trust. There's a trust in play uh, with that. Okay? And remember, most times conflicts arise, they arise with people that have got a relationship lower than trust. So they know, they know each other, they hardly know each other, they don't like each other, uh, they have to work together but they don't talk, whatever. That's, that's conflict where it comes from. Okay? If you've got tr implicit trust in a relationship, then you can deal with conflict in a much more effective way and it's less personal as well. Okay? Okay, then you've got character. This comes back to positive intent, okay? This comes back to um, 
uh, positive intent. So, uh, what I'm um, saying here is, um, if you believe people around you have positive intent, when a conflict arises, nobody's gone and done it on purpose just to annoy you. Okay, so just, just think on that for a moment. If you have positive, if you believe in positive intent, intent from the people around you, when somebody does something that annoys you, they haven't done it just to annoy you. Because you don't think that way. You think, why have they done that? I wonder what caused them to take that action and try and help them rather than going, they've done me, they've done that just to wind me up. Yeah? And do you know what? If you've got any organisational terrorists in, in, in the business, then there might be one or two people that do stuff just to wind you up. But I find, generally, people don't do stuff to wind other people up. They just do stuff sometimes without thinking. Yeah, so that's what it means by having positive intent. Because if you don't have positive intent, it's, very, it's a long week when you think people are just annoying you all week. And it knocks your resilience, and then of course it puts you into fight mode, so you're ready for a conflict at that point, okay? Uh, you're, you're ready for that to happen, uh, aren't you there? Uh, our numbers have increased a bit as well, so. Uh, okay, then we've got contribution and motivation. Now, you might be saying, <clears throat> what has motivation got anything to do? Well, first of all, resilience, if you're not motivated, your resilience will drop. It's, that's easy, take the box, right? Uh, if you're not motivated, you're not bothered, you know, and if something knocks you, you'll just go into flight and you'll move away from it, okay? Um, Motivation is very important in conflict resolution, but it's important for a couple of ways. It's very useful, but it's also something we have to watch, okay? So to be motivated to deal with the conflict is very, very useful. Uh, but sometimes the motivation to defend yourself, the fight response, sometimes we have to try and dampen it down a little bit. Because sometimes having a conflict when your emotions are very high, and I've just, uh, this morning we talked about exactly the same thing with giving immediate feedback, okay? When your emotions are very high, sometimes that's not the best time to have the conflict or deal with the conflict, okay? Uh, if it's business or health and safety critical, then you don't have a choice. You've got to deal with the conflict in whatever mood you're in whatever emotions you've got, okay? But that motivation to fix things, and it also depends on your, uh, for those that remember that term gestalt, lack of gestalt, when there is a conflict in your head, you, the picture in your head doesn't match the outside world. So it knocks us into lack of balance, lack of gestalt. And depending on your profile, you, some of you will want to deal with the conflict and fix it so you can get back into balance as quickly as possible. So you can feel gestalt again as quickly as possible. And other people don't deal with it that way. Other people go, actually, I have got lack of balance, so what I'm gonna go and do is I'm gonna go and sleep on it, I'm gonna wake up feeling slightly differently, and I'm gonna be able to deal with it in a better way. Now, depending on your personality profile, your motivation to do one or the other, your contribution to that conflict is gonna be different. Okay, so I'll quite happily tell you, me and my ex-wife, when we used to have an argument, oh, we used to have an argument, okay, so the conflict arises, my high red profile needs to deal with it there and then, so it's done, there's balance, we can bring equilibrium uh, back into it, okay, whereas her profile was, do you know what, it's not the right time to deal with it, because, you know, we're just going to argue, so let's sleep on it and deal with it tomorrow, wow. Two very, very different ways of looking at it. And of course, you're both slightly out of balance until it's fixed anyway, yeah? But sometimes, I went to bed, woke up, and actually thought that was probably the right thing to do, actually. Not deal with it there and then. And then other times, I thought, actually, we should have dealt with it then. Yeah? So, there's no, there's no rule of thumb when it comes to this, but it is something you've got to watch, not only in resilience, but also in conflict management. What is your motivation doing? Is it giving you energy to fight? Is it get, making you think to flight? And maybe consider it in the morning? And so on and so on and so on, yeah? Um, just, you, you've got to bear that in mind, okay? 
Um, coping strategies. Uh, so this is about um, resilient coping strategies. At the time we talked about whatever they are, self-talk triggers, uh, mindfulness, uh, you know, giving your brain a break and making it calm down every now and then, uh, getting some exercise, all that type of stuff came in coping strategies. Uh, I'm going to give you some tools around conflict specifically uh, before we finish, okay? And then control, and that's over your thoughts. And of course, your thoughts lead to your emotions. Yeah, thinking, emotions, actions, results. So that again goes back to self-talk and what you're saying. Um, you know, and if there's a conflict that happens, if you're sitting there and all of your thoughts are hindering, and you're going, I can't believe they've done that. They knew I didn't want them to do that. They've done it just to annoy me. I am bloody fuming. If all of that is going on in your thoughts, imagine the chemicals that are being released. Yeah, the uh, adrenaline that's going into your system, yeah, uh, and now you're coming up with different scenarios of what you're going to do and how you're going to shout at them and you're going to give them a piece of your mind and this, that and all of a sudden, it's not going to go very well at that point. Likewise, it might be somebody else doing that to you. So let's say you've done something that's annoyed somebody else and they come to the table with all of that going on in their head. That's going to put you into a defensive mode. You're going to have to want to fight, yeah, or exit from it, depending on what your profile is. And either way, the conflict doesn't get resolved very well, okay? So, <clears throat> that was a quick reset, a, a quick recap on resilience, but this time linking it to conflict, okay? So, if you're taking one learning point away from this part of the session, in order to be better at conflict resolution, we need to make sure that we're as resilient as we can be every day. And resilience means doing all of that on a regular basis, okay? Uh, and I've got a bit more for it. I'm literally gonna whip through it though because I wanna get to the conflict stuff for you. Competence, you've gotta practice, practice, practice. Be good at what you do, okay? Just be good at what you do. Uh, remember, they reckon to make an expert, you've gotta do something for over 10,000 hours to be an expert in it. <clears throat> so do you know what, unless you've worked for 30, 40, 50 years, because that is 10,000 hours, not, you know, not, not just 10,000 hours, but you know, you can't include time at home and, uh, you know, your days off and holiday, no, no, this is 10,000 hours specifically at one thing. Not many people can call themselves experts, okay, um, but it, it will increase your uh, resilience. Uh, and to a certain degree, it will help you in conflict if you are the expert. Okay, but that, that a lot of people I meet call themselves experts and I would question it. I'm sure there's nobody on this call, of course, uh, but uh, there's a few people that I've met that I'm an expert in and I think, mm. and then I ask them some questions about their career and all that stuff and I think, really? Have you really done 10,000 hours at this? Really, have you? Um, so just bear that in mind, okay. Um, have the knowledge or know where to find it. So in other words, uh, one key thing with resilience is continued learning, which I mentioned earlier, okay? Uh, confidence, self-education, learning every day, um, imposter syndrome, that was a session that I did before for people. Uh, when people feel like an imposter, they feel like they're playing at their job. Um, and there will be somebody on the call that's done a bit of that over the years. Uh, I've had senior ops directors and sales directors and MDs tell me that they've been doing it for 15 years and still feel like an imposter, like they're blagging it. Uh, so again, that, that detracts from your resilience. And of course, if that detracts from your resilience, it means that you're more prone, for co prone to conflict. Because if your resilience is low, you're on the edge. You're on the edge and you're ready for conflict and so on and so on and so on, yeah? Chunk things down, make things smaller, that will make you more confident. It will also make you more resilient uh, on the back of it. Uh, build relationships. If for, the, for those that have been coming every Tuesday for these sessions, you all have heard me say something called relationship currency. Building relationship currency with people uh, and getting them to a level of trust like I talked about earlier is very, very important. If you go out of your way to build levels of relationship to a level of trust, People, you are more trustworthy, you trust more people, your resilience is higher, less conflict is taken, okay, at that point. Talking therapy, downtime, recovery zone. One of the best things to keep you resilient is resting. Okay, so having the right rest. If you've done 10 days in a row at work, you've done long days, 
you, you're a bit stressed, and so on and so on and so on. Like I said to you earlier, the tiny little thing can go wrong, and all of a sudden, boom, it's like an explosion. Everything's gone wrong with the day. How many times, if I had a pound for the amount of people that I said to them, you're all right, you having a good day? And the answer was, I'm having a nightmare. Everything's going wrong. Everything. Wow, what a statement. Yeah? Everything's going wrong. The problem with that, as you guys know, the moment you say everything's going wrong, your brain goes, okay, let's focus on what's going wrong. Yeah? And some of that wrong could be some conflicts on the way. So that's why it's so important. Okay? Uh, I'll put some exercise in there as well. Uh, you've got some more exercise, motivation, towards and away from. Why do you do what you do? You will often find, by the way, this. If you have people that you know that go to work and their only motivation is to get paid, that's their only motivation, so it's an away from motivated, yeah? They go to work, they don't want to really be there, but the pain of not getting paid is too great, yeah? So it's away from. Those people tend to have lots of conflicts. It's as simple as that, okay? Because they go to work and they just want to get paid and go home. Yeah? So they tend to have more conflicts because if anything comes in, it's a, oh God, I've got to do that. Oh, that's not my job. Why am I now doing this? And so on and so on and so on. Whereas the people that come to work, enjoy the job, like their colleagues, get a sense of satisfaction, contribute towards society, build self-esteem, they have less conflicts or they at least walk into less conflicts at the same time. Slightly different mindset when it comes to it, okay? Control, self-talk, we've done this loads of times before guys, I know I'm going through at this pace uh, for you, but we've done it. What are you talking to yourself? What triggers have you got in place? If you wake up this morning and went, oh, I'm knackered, it's going to be a nightmare every day today, oh, I've got to deal with that idiot as well. If you said all of that when you woke up this morning, I'll guarantee you you'll find some conflicts today. Whereas if you woke up this morning and went, oh, do you know what? It's good, it's a good day, the sun's shining, I'm going to go to work, have a great day, feel good, get some stuff done, come back, enjoy the rest of the winter sunshine that we've got, or autumn sunshine, then you'll probably find less conflicts in the day as well, okay? Uh, build some new pathways, some new dendrites, you guys know about that, yeah? And take some action on the back of it. So, that's all resilience, but I'm hoping now you can see how resilience leads through to conflict. If you have low resilience, it's a major factor in causing conflict or not dealing with conflict very, very well, okay? So now, let's look at what the conflict is, what conflict is. A, series, a serious disagreement or argument, typically a protracted one, okay? So, if, this, if you want to make it even more simple than that, it's a disagreement of opinion, okay? Now, I love it in an argument when somebody goes, well, no, that's not how it is. Fact. Okay? Now, facts are very dubious things. Yeah? What a fact, a fact is in somebody's mind is not a fact in somebody else's mind. Yeah? So then you'll start to find that you're trying to argue facts. But uh, most of the time, people don't argue fact. They argue opinion. Okay, so it's our opinion. Remember, we have our own filing cabinet going on in our head. We have our own filing cabinet going in our head. So you see something, hear it, smell it, taste it, whatever the sense, it goes into your filing cabinet through your filter and then you store it. And everybody else does the same, but they haven't got the same filter as you. Everybody's got their own filter. So when you then recall information, it might be slightly different to if somebody else has been standing next to you. You can have two people standing next to each other on a pavement somewhere. They witness an accident in front of them and you will get two slightly different accounts of what happened. Okay? That's how different our filing cabinets are. Which is why often, don't use facts. There, there isn't there are very few facts in the world, okay? It's your... It's your opinion of the fact. It's how you see the fact, which will then be argued at that point, or that's where conflict uh, comes up, okay? So let's lose this fact thing out of our heads and now know we are actually, the conflict is about two different filing cabinets. 
The way that we see things, that's what conflict is about, okay? So, conflict, oh, they're not in order today, are they? Conflict types, there's four conflict types, okay? The first one is conflict with self. That's when you're having an argument with yourself, okay? How many people on this session today have arguments with themselves? It goes like this, um, oh, John, you sh why did you do that, you idiot? Well, you should do that, really, John. Yeah, I don't want to, but you should do it. How many people on here have self-arguments? Just put me a yes in the chat box, yeah? Because I'm not the only one. I know I am not the only one, yeah? All the time, <laughs> all the time, Christian. Jo Joanna said yes, Tim's put oh yes. We do it all the time, don't we? It's what we call internal conflict, okay? Um, you can change, the main way you can change that is by your self-talk, okay? Because it's internal to you, the main way you can deal with it is by changing your internal self-talk and creating some triggers and so on and so on and so on and so on, okay? Then we've got conflict with others. Now we all know what that means, don't we? It's a conflict with another person's filing cabinet. Okay, we'll come on to that in a moment, right? Uh, then we've got conflict with environment. Conflict with environment. Um, that means you have a conflict with what's going on around you. Yeah? What's the biggest thing in the British culture that we like to have a good old moan about and whinge about and get into conflict with regarding our environment? What do you think that is? What's the biggest thing in the British culture that we have a conflict about? Straight in there, Toby, the weather. That's what it is. We have a conflict with the weather. We moan when it rains. We moan when it's too hot. Yeah, it just seems to be something as a culture we like to do, don't we? We even change measurement units sometimes when we're talking. When it's freezing, we're like, do you know what? It's minus five, that's Celsius, yeah? And then when it's hot, oof, do you know what? It's 100, 110 today, that's Fahrenheit. We even change the unit of measurement so we can moan about it a bit more because we are in conflict with the situation, yeah? I, you must have heard me do it. This is the second session I've run today in here, and it's 20 odd degrees outside, four lighting rigs on me in here, and I'm all in here all afternoon as well. So I quite have a bit of conflict sometimes, but yeah, would I want it to be raining outside? No, I wouldn't want that either, yeah? So, environment, conflict. Now that one is happening quite a lot at the moment because your working environment, if you've gone back into the office, has probably changed a little bit because of COVID, yeah? or you're working at home and you might have some conflicts there with your environment as well. So all of these things cause conflict, okay? Uh, and then you've got conflict with the supernatural, okay? Now without me getting to, into religion here, uh, which I'm not going to do, um, this is where you kind of, you know, and I've done this in the past, you know when everything's going wrong and you start to convince yourself it's only happening to you and you look up at the heavens and you go, really? Are you really, really doing this to me? Yes, that is called a conflict with the supernatural. I don't know whether that's just me that does that, but I'm sure it isn't, yeah? But we have this conflict that the world is against us. Yeah, somebody somewhere is pulling strings and the world is against us. That is the conflict uh, of supernatural. So, four different con conflicts here, okay? Um, supernatural, and internal is self-talk, okay? So you can combat that with a lot of straight self-talk, okay? Conflict with others, slightly different. We need to think about that in a moment. Uh, and your environment, well, fight, flight, or change your self-talk again. So can you fight against it and change your environment? Can you exit from it? Or can you change your mindset and, and get your head around it? Those are the options when it comes to it. The biggest one that a lot of people deal with, of course, as you will rightly tell me, is conflict with others, which is why a lot of people come on these things. But please don't dis di diminish the internal conflict because the amount of times that winds you up more so than conflict with others. Um, but go onto the YouTube channel, look at the what you say when you talk to yourself playlist, okay? And have a look at some 
self-talk triggers uh, in there, okay, about that, because that stops the internal conflict, okay? Um, you've all seen this before. If you haven't, then welcome to the group, because uh, you haven't been watching uh, uh, sessions before, because I've used this a number of times. This is a, a personality profile. I'm not going to go through it in detail, because I've done it a hundred times, but what I will say is this. If you have a high red profile, and a high green profile, looking at something, there may be a conflict. Uh, why? Because you've got two massively different personalities. You've got a high red, that's assertive, action orientated, direct, straight to the point, wants to crack on. And then you've got a high green that's calm, supportive, uh, compassionate, empathetic, listening. Okay? So there may be conflict between those two colours. However, opposites do attract. So when you do put those two colours together, you get a great team dynamic. But it doesn't mean they're always going to see eye to eye. Exactly the same with the yellow, blue, blue, yellow. Uh, you've got a high blue that's very technical, formal, exacting, data driven, analytical. And then you've got a high yellow that's very sociable, light hearted, flamboyant. Those two don't always see eye to eye uh, on things. A high yellow will probably find figures boring. A high blue finds them stimulating. There is a, there is a disconnect between the diagonals of these profiles. So as I've done in previous sessions with you guys, uh, I wouldn't expect you, I wouldn't expect a high red to become a high green to deal with a conflict, but what I would expect is if there is a conflict between these two colours, you both adapt your profile in order to deal with the conflict. So in that case, the red would become less red, and more green. The green would bring the green down and be a bit more red. You would find a nice compromise in the middle and you deal with the conflict. Okay? Because nine times out of ten, conflict isn't about actually what's been done. It's about the way people have done it. And that will be a conflict for people. Okay? So please bear that in mind uh, when it comes to it. So moving towards the end then, conflict strategies. I've got some conflict strategies for you. Uh, and, then, <clears throat> and then that pause model, which is really, really important if you're caught in the middle of a conflict uh, without having time to prepare uh, for it, okay? So, number one, conflict strategy, acknowledgement, okay? Now, this, this is part of pause as well, but um, a lot of conflicts happen because people don't feel that their thoughts have been acknowledged, okay? So, people often get into a conflict mode because they're vying for attention. They want you to know, they want you to tell them that they've heard you. If that makes sense, it was a bit of a garbled way of saying it, wasn't it? They want to be heard, they're vying, it's like children. My children do it, my five and six year old. Uh, so six and seven they are now. If one of them's talking, the other one won't want to talk. Yeah? And if I just hold them, it's all, you can see them getting more annoyed. Whereas they probably weren't going to talk anyway, but the other one's talking. And it's about that acknowledgement. So when, when there is a conflict situation, one of the first things you can do is acknowledge those people. Acknowledge it. Okay, yeah, got it. Right, I can hear what you're saying. Yeah? So just acknowledge that and, how, and define what it is specifically that's, that, 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 that's, that's moving them into fight. Yeah? And you might have to do a little bit of um, uh, research uh, for this as well, which is an understanding. We'll get onto that in a moment, okay? Um, don't freeze or procrastinate. Sometimes that happens in conflict management. So I've talked to you about fight and I've talked to you about flight. If, if in a conflict situation somebody's going to fight, they have a load of adrenaline and they're majorly defensive and they're ready to go at you. If somebody uh, uh, flights, then they'll just keep nodding at you as long as you keep them there and then they want to run off because that's an exit, okay? But sometimes people just freeze and you can't get anything out of them. It's like trying to get blood out of a stone. You kind of want to shake them up and go, come on, say something. But the fact that they're not saying anything, is it's, it's almost like they've been paralyzed in the conflict. Okay? Uh, and we need to watch out for that because it causes procrastination and it means the problem doesn't get uh, resolved quickly. It just gets left. And it goes on and on and on and on until it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And then something explodes and then people go and try and fix it. So just watch out for that procrastination phase, that, that zone. Yeah, again, you need to notice it and then get yourself out of it. Yeah. Um, you need to uh, also uh, acknowledge concerns. So there might be a problem, but now there's concerns around the problem which is causing the conflict as well. So, you know, there is people and process in this. 
So when you're acknowledging a conflict, acknowledge the process, the thing that's gone wrong, and the opinions of the people uh, that, are, that are making the conflict. So pr 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 always process and people, not just process, okay? Uh, that's in there. Uh, and also their needs, that, that will also come through as well. So number one is make sure in any conflict there is acknowledgement of the conflict. Because without that, people will keep getting more angry, more defensive, and they're vying for your attention at that point, okay? Uh, number two, ground rules. If you are going, and you can plan, if you know there's going to be a conflict situation, and you can plan for it, before you, before you actually get into the conflict, put some ground rules in place for the conflict. Now, this is of course, if you can plan for it, okay? I know you can't do this when it just happens, but just for a moment, this is if you can plan for it, okay? So put some ground rules in. Who's gonna speak? Maybe if there's more than two of you, even better, there's a chairperson. Yeah, and they act as a bit of a mediator. So, when somebody's speaking, nobody interrupts. Yeah, because if they're speaking and you interrupt, it's almost like they, they, you're gonna make it worse. They're gonna get more angry. So let them speak, let them have their say, then it moves over. I've even done this in real life sessions where somebody's had the pen. If you've got the pen, you can talk. If you haven't got the pen, you can't talk. If that's what it takes to shut everybody up, and deal with the conflict. If you want the pen, you need to ask for the pen. Otherwise, if you haven't got a pen, don't talk. If you have got a pen, talk, okay? So if you can put some ground rules in place, let people say what they need to say, it helps get them get it out, makes people feel better straight away. Respect other people's opinions. They may not be your opinions, yeah? Some people are hell-bent on turning the world to their opinions, you know? Sometimes people say that of me. I teach, look, all, look at the energy and passion I put into all this stuff. I so wholeheartedly believe in this stuff. And so when somebody's got a different opinion to me, sometimes I kind of go, mm, mm, mm. I don't think you're right. Yeah, but I, I hopefully wouldn't try and go and then continue to push it down their throat if they just had a different opinion to me. That's okay. That's all right. You've got a different filing cabinet. I've got a different filing cabinet, different of opinion. Do you know what though? If you've got a level of trust with that person, different opinions is okay, it's all good, no problem. Happy days, on the back of it, yeah? So again, it comes back to that relationship building as well. Respect each other's opinion. Um, address the issue, not the person. But you have got to address the people, and the process and the people. So let, let me just, I'm contradicting myself here, but I'm doing it for a reason. So address the fact, address actually what's gone wrong, and then address how people are feeling on the back of it. Okay? Uh, don't just start addressing, well, you're just saying that because you're in a bad mood. D does that make sense? Yeah? So what's, what's gone wrong? What's causing the conflict? Let's do some root cause analysis and find out uh, what's causing the conflict. Uh, and also, why would you say it the way you've said it? Where have you come from? Why has it annoyed you so much? And so on and so on and so on. Okay? So that's number two. Have ground rules. Okay? Number three. Find some common ground. You can see here. Yeah? The old little picture, two, two opinions overlapping, find some common ground. It's one of the first things a, ne a negotiator or influencer would want to do in a conflict situation. What's the common ground? What can we find out that's common between the two people that are in the conflict? Because that's the first step. If you can find there's some common ground, and in business, there should be one very simple common ground. Okay, and the common ground should be, whatever the conflict is about, you're both there to do the best you possibly can for your organization and your customers. That's your common ground, okay? So why, do, you know, when you do that, it affects this over here, and when you do that, it affects this over here. Okay, what's the common ground? We both want the best for the organization. We both want the best for the customers. So which way do we need to go about fixing this? Yeah? So find that common ground, yeah? Look for areas of agreement before you get into the conflict first, okay? Find some common ground and then tackle the conflict, like I've said there, yeah? Then we move on to number four, which is opinions, okay? Welcome different opinions. Now this is a mindset, okay? It, it, it's something I've had to learn to do, in all honesty. Uh, my high red 
quite often, with my ego, thinks my opinion is the right opinion. And that's the way it should be in the world. Um, and um, some of the time that's right, and some of the time it's not. Okay? And I think over time, I've actually, I welcome other people's opinion now, and go, okay, I'll tell you what, let's get other people's opinion first. That's going to give me some competence, it's going to give me some understanding, it's going to give me more confidence, and all the other stuff that we talked about earlier. Um, and then I could probably make a more informed decision. So, this is about, your opinion will be different to other people, that's okay. That's okay. Um, if you find some people that have got opinions the same as you, well that's alright as well. Yeah, but there might be a difference of opinion, so if we welcome different opinions, then we learn more. We don't always agree with different opinions, but it's still good to welcome them. So what do you think? Yeah, how would you tackle it? What do you think you would do to avert this conflict in the future? Rather than, well I'll tell you what we need to do, we need to do that and sort it out and then it won't happen again. Yeah, so again it's about asking questions maybe rather than telling. Uh, if you're in a situation, yeah? Um, and you could argue <coughs> that everybody is always right. Because in their own little head, for whatever reason, they will think they're right, okay? Whatever that is based on and the psychological bump behind it is beside the point. Most people, 99% of the time, do something and think they're right. Until hindsight sets in and then they think they might have done it in a better way. So if everybody's walking around thinking they're right, no wonder there is some conflict uh, uh, on the planet. But it's good to welcome those opinions, okay? And finally, the last one to finish off, which is a tool. So all of those tools, uh, one to four, uh, and the resilient stuff, you can do all of that if you know there's a conflict coming up, can't you? You can try and find some ground rules, you can try and find some common ground, you can make sure you're dealing with the facts and not just the person, uh, you can try and do some analysis of why the, why the conflict has arisen, you can do all of that prior to having a conversation where the conflict is going to arise. However, you might be in a conversation and all of a sudden you find yourself in an argument. Okay, so conflict has, has come up. Um, some people have seen me use this model before. I, I think I used it back with handling difficult conversations, uh, which is what it was designed for along with conflict resolution. Two very similar courses, handling difficult conversations, albeit there's, there's more to that. Um, uh, and then resolve uh, uh, conflict resolution. So, if you find yourself in a situation all of a sudden, there's an argument breaking out, there's a difference of opinion, you can feel a load of adrenaline going into your system to either fight or try to get away from the situation. What this little acronym, this little model does, is it gives you a get out, okay? It gives you a way of trying to deal with the conflict and also deal with your emotions at the time because you're getting angry, annoyed, fed up, worried, stressed, whichever way it's coming out. So if you ever find yourself in that position, the first thing you need to do, you'll notice uh, when we finish this, it spells pause because the P there stands for pause. So the first thing in any conflict situation is for you to do nothing, for you to pause. And the scientific reason for that is very simple. When you're under threat, adrenaline starts pumping around your system for fight or flight. If you pause for a moment, it, gives, it stops the adrenaline in, uh, um, release and it just lets whatever adrenaline in your system you've got, it lets it start to dissipate in the system. In other words, just calms you down a little bit before you actually do anything else, okay? So the first thing we do in a conflict situation is pause. The next thing we do, we've talked about, is acknowledge what's happened, okay? So the first thing is, okay guys, just, just give me a second here, just, just give me a moment. Have a drink of water, just pause. Okay, so what's happened is this, and you're not happy about it because, is that correct? So you're, you're acknowledging what has just happened, okay? Remember why people like to be acknowledged, otherwise they're veering, they're veering for, uh, uh, for air time, okay? Once you've acknowledged, you then seek to understand. Okay, let's understand. How did it arise? Why did it arise? 
what could we possibly do differently? Uh, you know, what can we do to fix it now? So you seek to understand. If you try and understand somebody's problem, they will become more amicable with you. Once you've understood, you then seek to find a solution for the future. Because I see a lot of people do that, PAU, and then stop. So they understand the problem, but haven't fixed it, and don't put a solution in for the future. So then you find the solution, so it either fixes the problem, or uh, it, it fixes the problem in the future. And finally, you execute the solution, not the person. And some people will be smiling there. But you, then you execute the solution. And again, I've seen people pause, acknowledge, understand the problem, come up with a solution, and then don't change anything, so two weeks later you have the same conflict. So the execution of the solution is just as important. Okay? So, if you're in a conflict situation and you can prepare for it, there's loads of stuff I've given you today from, from resilience all the way through to common ground and so on and so on. If you're in a conflict situation that you find yourself in, pause, acknowledge, understand, seek to find a solution and then execute the solution and you won't have the conflict again going forward. So I've just finished on time again, uh, which is great. I'm getting better at this, aren't I? After about 16 weeks of doing it, I'm starting to finish on time. Um, if you like the session, again, drop me some feedback uh, in there. If you've got any questions, you've got my details for now. Uh, ask me any details. If not, I will see you next week uh, for the next two sessions uh, coming up. Also, we're going to run some sessions up to Christmas, guys. So if there's any particular content that you want that you'd like to know more about, as always, please let me know uh, and we'll do it. Uh, otherwise, have a great week and I will see you next Tuesday. Bye for now.